Huh? How many times have you heard that reply to something you have said? Huh? Sometimes people actually say that to you because they didn't hear you. And they need you to say it again. And sometimes people say that to you because they didn't understand what you said. They heard the words, and instead of saying, well, what did you mean? They say, huh? And then sometimes, believe it or not, they, they heard you, they understood you, but they don't know how they want to reply. So they're just buying a little time. Huh? Huh? But perhaps the worst one of all is the one that's just a habit. Do you know that there are people who know what you said, they understood what you said, they know how they want to reply, but they're just in the habit when someone says something to them to say, huh? In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, and we talked about the two passages we're going to consider right now to introduce our lesson on Wednesday night. But it's very important that we understand that, that the Bible teaches without faith. It is impossible to please God. But those who would come to him must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so faith is a saving requirement. You cannot go to heaven without faith. And so it ought to be on the minds of every human being. How do I obtain? How do I possess? How do I establish this saving faith? And the answer is in Hebrews 1, chapter 10, and verse 17. Faith comes by what? Huh? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And so hearing problems, I want you to understand, prevent God's will from being done. Look at a, a very simple statement by Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4 and verse 9. Mark chapter 4 and verse 9, and I actually thought about using this as, as the scripture reading because really this is the main message of our lesson. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You see, faith is required and therefore hearing is essential. When we exercise our faculties and gifts the way God intended, his will is done. I remember years ago, I was with my best friend, Tony Wallace, and as poor college students, we did everything to, to make a buck, and he was actually the janitor for the Oklahoma Christian Academy, for the school that met at the Memorial Road Church of Christ. And I remember we were in there, and, you know, cleaning up and emptying trash cans and, and sweeping floors and putting chairs in the right place, and, and I saw this poster on the wall, and it intrigued me. And it said, I know you think you understood what I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. And the title on the poster was Communication Problem. I know you think you understood what I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. That, to me, defines the problem that we all have with communication. And really, when you talk about relationship problems, most relationship problems are really a communication problem. And so this morning, I want to consider the cause of hearing problems. What is the cause of hearing problems? There are always competing voices for your attention. Don't you find that to be true? Isn't that the case in your life, that there are competing voices for your attention? Frankly, we have competing interests. 
And so we need to understand what causes this problem. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. It's a very interesting passage. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods whom you've not known, and let us serve them. Verse 3 says, You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams. Now, you understand? This is someone who actually in some way found a way to do something miraculous. There was some kind of substantial sign that may give weight to his message. But, 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 but may we never forget whose voice it is that we're supposed to listen to. And so it says, For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And the key verse here is verse 4. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments. Listen to his voice. God's voice is the only voice that we need to be concerned about. We need to serve him, and we need to cling to him. Competing voices make it difficult to hear the right voice. Competing voices make it difficult to hear God's voice. I hesitate to use this illustration, but has anyone ever watched Meet the Press? Now, I don't know if, if you even could, but when I was a boy, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be honest, like, we didn't go to church. I didn't grow up going to church. And I remember my father on Sunday morning turning that program on, Meet the Press. And I was intrigued that he would watch it every week, so I, I decided I was going to check it out and see what I thought about Meet the Press. Do you realize that when you have a bunch of men on a panel who all talk at the same time, you have no idea what any of them are saying? And I'm like, why does my dad watch this show? I mean, even if I understood the political climate of the time, I would not have understood the message of any of those people because they did nothing but shout over one another for the entire program. To me, that defines competing voices. And so I want to tell you this morning, beware of the voice of family. I mean, you might be sitting there thinking, what are you talking about? Beware of the voice of family? Sometimes the family voice becomes so loud that it drowns out God's voice. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. Jesus said, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That There are people who live their entire lives exclusively for their family. And there's nobleness in that. That, that is worthy in many ways until it gets to the point where the family becomes more important than God. And so I want to say beware the voice of family when it's a competing voice with God's voice. Loving your family is, is beautiful. It's wonderful. But loving your family more than God and loving your family more than God's family is dangerous. It can actually cost your soul. Someone very recently told me that there was a church somewhere where the, the elders got up front on a Sunday morning and said, listen, uh, this is a special day. It's a family day. And so we're not going to meet tonight so that you can spend more time with your family. I just want to suggest that what we do here is family time, Amen. number one. And number two, there's plenty of time in the week that you can value as family time without compromising God's time. Beware the voice of family. Beware the voice of fears. Do you know that there are people, you've met them, right? 
They're afraid of everything. They really are afraid of their own shadow. And they are robbed of the blessings that God has for them because they listen to the voice of fears. Look at what Jesus says about that in John chapter 14. The Gospel of John chapter 14 and verse 27. It's a beautiful and comforting passage. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. The the voice of God through Jesus says that we we don't place family above God and we don't place our fears above God. Remember, 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? So beware the voice of family. Beware the voice of fears. Beware the verse of finances. Hey, i got to be honest with you. I'm, I'm grateful that, that you are gainfully employed. Because if you're not gainfully employed, guess what? I'm not gainfully employed. So I'm thankful to God that he's blessed you at work and that you give generously to the work of this church. It helps my family twofold, right? But we cannot allow finances to drive our every decision, to drive the most important decisions. If God gave you that job, why would you want to let that job become what's most important in your life? If you lose that job, God can replace it. He will replace it. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 32. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 32. Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek... For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. And so we don't have to be concerned about finances. Of course, we need to do what God has asked us to do to take care of our families. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8 says that basically if a man does not provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And and that passage has always been mind-blowing to me that that he compares someone who doesn't take care of his family with someone who doesn't even believe in God. It's important to meet financial responsibilities. But God's voice is more important than the voice of finance. It's more important than the voice of fun. Look at Luke chapter 12, verses 19 through 31. Luke chapter 12. Verses 19 through 21. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? It's easy to allow fun to dominate your life. I think it was Kim McGee the other night who told me that there's either a Stars game or a Mavs game for the next two weeks straight. And I love watching the Stars, and I love watching the Mavs. I mean, they won on Friday night and Saturday night, and if they don't win, that is the Mavs uh, today, you might lose me this afternoon. But we have to have spiritual priority. We can't allow our fun to be a louder voice in our life than the voice of God. I want to say that we need to avoid the voice of sin. Look at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7 The Bible says, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, 
and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Have you ever thought about sin crouching at your door? Just waiting for you to come out, waiting to leap, waiting to attack. Sin has a desire for you. Sin's voice is always talking to your mind and to your heart and to your soul, and it wants to disrupt the fellowship that you have with God. Avoid the voice of sin and avoid, obviously, obviously the voice of Satan. Look at the temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. And verse 1, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, and verse 1, Matthew records for us, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For time's sake, well, we're not going to read through the temptation, but, but I'm telling you right now, Jesus was hearing the voice of his Father, and he was hearing the voice of Satan. These were competing Voices, And there's really no difference in our lives today. There is the will of God, and there is the will of the devil, and we have to ask ourselves, whose voice are we going to allow to ring clear in our lives? Avoid the voice of sin. Avoid the voice of Satan. And avoid the voice of self. In so many ways, the voice of sin and the voice of Satan pale in comparison to the voice of self. It really boils down to the question, what do I want? And so many times we want to choose what we want over what God wants. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And verse 14, James 1 and verse 14, to me, defines the voice of self. James says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. You see, that is the voice of self. Charles Barkley is not a role model. I think we can all agree with that. But he's got a commercial out right now where he's got a little Charles Barkley on his shoulder. And and he tries to talk to Charles about what Charles wants. And and all I remember about this commercial, honestly, I, I don't even remember what it was about other than this one little part where he says, Chuck, We're hungry. I'm hungry. You're hungry. I want cupcakes. Listen, there's a little voice on the shoulder of every one of us. And it is telling us what it is that we want. That is a competing voice. And so beware the voice of family, fears, finances, fun. Avoid the voice of sin, Satan, and self. But listen. This is the whole point. Listen to the voice of God through his son. Listen to the voice of God through his son. Look at Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, at the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says, While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. There there are competing voices, but listen to Jesus. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 29. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 29, Jesus says, he who has an ear. There's that expression again. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen to the voice of God through his Son. Listen to the voice of God through his Spirit. And we know that God's Spirit speaks to us through his divine word. 
John 6, 63, the flesh profits nothing. The spirit gives life. The words I'm speaking to you are spirit and life. And listen to the voice of God through his saints. This is the way that God communicates his message to mankind today. Through his son, through his spirit, and through his saints. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, You are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. A people for God's own possession. If you are a child of God, then you belong to God. You are part of God's family. And by the way, this passage is written to all Christians in the areas to which this letter was distributed. This wasn't church leaders. This was all members of the body of Christ. And he said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. In other words, it is your charge to let people know what God has done for you. You represent a voice for God. Now, how you do that, I understand it's going to be different for everyone. I I do. I, I really do get that. But if we're going to solve hearing problems, we first of all have to understand the cause. And and one of the principal causes we have are competing voices. Look at Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 21. Luke 16, 19 through 21 says, Now there was a certain rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, linen, gaily living in splendor every day. And a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now it came about that the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I'm in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. And now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over from here to you may not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. Now, I just want you to understand that when it came to the rich man, he obviously listened to the voice of family and fears and finances and fun. I think there's enough within the verses we just read to make it clear that he had all of that in spades. And there's enough in the text to make it clear that Lazarus didn't. But but it would be a necessary inference to suggest that Lazarus listened to the voice of God through his son and through his spirit and through his saints not in that necessary, uh, necessary uh, dispensation, but nonetheless, God's people had to be someone that Lazarus was listening to. Now notice, as this comes to a, an end, he says, that is the rich man says, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that, they may, that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them do what? Huh? Let them hear them. You see, the rich man had a hearing problem, and he was convinced his family members, his brothers, had a hearing problem too. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. You see, it goes back to the miraculous. It goes back to the sign. And if you remember Deuteronomy, it was very clear that here was a case where that actually would have misled them if they weren't focused in on the voice of God. 
But verse 31 says, but he said to him, if they do not listen, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. I'm pretty sure, I'm not absolutely sure, but it, it seemed as though everyone who got up front today mentioned mothers. So, so let me just say, happy Mother's Day. I, I love Mother's Day. I, I think it's a day where we get to honor people that were so important in our lives, that, that got us to where we are. I, I, I walked in this morning, and Michael walked up to me, and, and he said that um, I guess maybe Juan wished Rena a happy Mother's Day. And, and he asked her, how long you been married? And she said, 34 years. And Juan said, poor thing. How do you put up with him? And she goes, well, I send him to California every other week. <laughs> We're going to pray for you, Rena. But I'll tell you, what about mothers? Every Christian mother wants her children to be faithful. That is priority number one. And that can't happen without solving the hearing problem. And so this morning, I just wanted to establish the problem, the cause of hearing problems. Next week, we want to talk about the cure of hearing problems and, and the consequences of hearing problems. Don't listen to the competing voices of family, fears, finances, fun, sin, Satan, and self. Listen to his son, his spirit, and his saints. And if we have someone this morning who's not a New Testament Christian, I promise you, if you are not a New Testament Christian and you decide today, I just want to do what Jesus said to be right with him and secure my eternity, there is no greater gift you could give to your mother than to live a faithful Christian life. And if you are a child of God and you're struggling with sins and, and you recognize how challenging those competing voices are, li listen, if you're, not, if you're not wrestling with that, you're not alive. It's real. The struggle is real. And we all need help. But if you've been trying to go it alone and you want the help of your church family, whatever your need is, won't you let it be known as together we stand and sing.